When you think of events big enough to be capable of filling a stadium like this, what do you think of? Professional sports, rock concerts, or even the Olympic Games? Could the message of one man ever be dynamic enough to draw crowds the size of the World Series or the Super Bowl? Could one messenger of hope draw capacity crowds into facilities meant mainly for entertainment just to hear a message of faith night after night, year after year, decade after decade? Yes, sir. Take me to the cross. I can find my way home from there. He came out of nowhere. He was not born into a prominent family or thrust onto the universal stage like a political leader. He simply took his God-given talent and passion and proclaimed a message that inspired people all over the world. When huge high-dollar events couldn't fill a stadium like this, you could always rely on the message of one man to provide a standing room only crowd, Billy Graham. He conquered the grave, and because he lives, we can not only face tomorrow, but because he lives, I know that I shall not endure one minute in hell. I know that I'll never come under the judgment of God, even though I deserve it. Before he had any idea what his future might be, or any awareness that he might have a special mission, Billy Graham was living a typical farm boy's life in a small southern town. William Franklin Graham Jr. had roots that ran deep into the North Carolina soil. Both his grandfathers were veterans of the Civil War. His paternal grandfather purchased the land on which he grew up after that war. And farming became the way of life for several generations of Grahams. After picking beans all day, Morrow Graham gave birth to Billy Frank, as they would call him, around 4 p.m. in the afternoon in a downstairs bedroom of their frame house on November the 7th, 1918, just four days before the armistice that ended the First World War. Billy was the first of four children that would be born to Frank and Morrow Graham and reared in the tranquil setting of the sprawling pastures and low hills of the family's dairy farm. We were very typical of country people. My brother, who is five and a half years older than I, never uh, took to farming. He worked only because my daddy required him to. He was interested primarily in baseball, and I never will forget in the late 20s, I was very small, and my brother was a young teenager. Uh, Babe Ruth came to put on an exhibition with the Yankees here in Charlotte. My daddy got an uh, introduction with uh, Babe Ruth and had let Billy uh, shake his hand. And uh, I don't think Billy ever forgot that. Billy Graham did not show any real seriousness for academic studies. He was an average student and his grades reflected the fact that he worked hard on the farm and had an abundance of energy. These characteristics provided some insight into the kind of man Billy would become and the potential direction his life would take. We'd play in the woods. He'd play Tarzan. He read these Tarzan books. We'd get out and cut an old grapevine and swing across a ravine or a branch or something, you know, and make out like we're swinging in the <laughs> with the apes. The Grahams were members of the Associated Reformed Presbyterian Church in downtown Charlotte, and they attended regularly. 
Even though Billy's parents had limited education, Morrow Graham would read the Bible to the family in the evenings and Frank Senior would pray. However, this did not mean that Billy naturally enjoyed going to church. I don't even remember not going to church, he said. If I told my parents I didn't want to go, they would have wailed the tar out of me. Like it or not, Billy went every Sunday. By all appearances, Billy Graham was just like any other boy his age. But there was something about Graham that separated him from the rest of his peers. He had a gift that even he did not recognize. I always thought that um, the reason Billy never took to farming or to have any interest in cattle was that even then the Lord saw that he had something else for him to do. In 1920, in Quinyang, China, Ruth Bell was born to Dr. and Mrs. Nelson Bell, the second of four children. The Bells had left their home in Virginia four years earlier and went to China to work as medical missionaries. Dr. Bell became the chief of surgery and superintendent of a large Presbyterian mission hospital located 150 miles east of Shanghai. Ruth's otherwise idyllic childhood was surrounded by dangers from marauding bandits and communist rebels trying to topple Chiang Kai-shek by monsoons, sandstorms and epidemics that would decimate villages. However, China was home, and these tribulations created strength of character and planted the seeds in her heart to become a missionary. In those days, Charlotte, North Carolina, had a reputation for being a leading church-going city, with itinerant evangelists traveling there to preach. A wooden structure had been erected on property at the edge of town that would seat 5,000 people for popular evangelists like Billy Sunday and Mordecai Ham to hold meetings for weeks at a time. When Mordecai Ham came to Charlotte, Graham was reluctant to attend. He said, everything I heard or read about him made me feel antagonistic towards the whole affair. It sounded like a religious circus. It wasn't until good friend Albert McMakin invited him and his friends, brothers Grady and T.W. Wilson, to go to hear Ham that Billy showed any interest in the revival. Graham was especially moved by Ham's description of sin and rebellion and felt that Ham was pointing right at him. Graham couldn't escape the conviction, so at the invitation, he went forward and accepted Christ. Grady Wilson also went forward, and their lives were then forever intertwined. The change in Billy from his experience at the Ham Revival seemed to provide a purpose and a direction to his life that he had lacked. I went up to my room, not realizing what had happened, really. It didn't feel any different. And I remember kneeling down, it was a full moonlight night, and I looked out across the woods and the fields, and uh, I said, Lord, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what this means, but whatever it means, uh, I would appreciate your help. By the age of 13, Ruth's parents made plans for her to join her older sister, Rosa, at a boarding school in North Korea. Ruth was very resistant to the idea of having to leave her home, family, and her dear friends. She even prayed to God the night before she embarked for school that God would let her die before morning. She wrote, By 1937, I had my future securely planned. I would never marry. I would spend the rest of my life as a missionary in Tibet. She went on, but on July the 7th of that year, the Japanese attacked Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing, beginning the occupation of northern China. And while my father prepared for war, my mother prepared me for college in the United States. I argued that all I needed was a utilitarian knowledge of Tibetan and the Bible. I certainly didn't have to sail halfway around the world for that. My parents simply smiled and put me on a boat to the United States. I was not happy.
The first summer out of high school, Billy and Grady Wilson sold fuller brushes together. One of Billy's uncles said he wouldn't last a week. But Billy was determined and said he felt like he had the most important product in the world. He wound up selling the most brushes of anybody in his region. Even though he was successful as a salesman, of course he knew this was not really the life for him and he enrolled in Bob Jones College, only to leave after one semester when told by the head of the college that he was a failure and predicted more failure ahead. In 1937, Graham enrolled in the Florida Bible Institute and it was here that he began to thrive under the tutelage of teachers like John Minder and Cecil Underwood who helped to provide a clear focus for his life. He would started preaching to stumps on the riverbank down there. He'd point to them like they were people. And he'd stand up on a stump like it was a pulpit. And uh, I think people around there thought, you know, he was a little imbalanced. And they'd never seen anything like that. But by the time he was 18, one year later, he was preaching uh, to large groups, fairly large groups of people down in Florida. I mean, like 500 or 1,000. We couldn't believe it. My mother and daddy just couldn't believe it. So they wanted to go down there and, at Christmas time one year and, and see if what they were hearing was true. But I know the first time I heard him preach, he preached loud, so loud you wouldn't believe it. He didn't need any microphone or anything. He didn't need any amplification. Literally, you could hear him a quarter of a mile away. And my mother, she thought he did so well preaching, but she told him, she said, son, you can't preach so loud. People, you'll scare people away. While a student at the Institute, he became an ordained Baptist minister at the Peniel Baptist Church in 1939. Upon graduating from Florida Bible Institute at 21, he went directly to Wheaton College in Chicago, where a beautiful young woman caught his eye and he kept it focused on her for the rest of his life. When we were first uh, introduced at Fleeton, he was carrying a load of furniture. May I add, I think that's the last stick of furniture he's ever carried. <laughs> Billy Graham was a determined man, set on a path to be an evangelist. I passed him on the steps of Blanchard Hall. He was going down and I was going up. And my impression was, as a young man in a hurry, I didn't think much more of it. Ruth Bell was equally clear-headed about her own life. Becoming a missionary in Tibet was her sole focus. In spite of an instant and mutual attraction for one another, almost from the moment they met, both Graham and Bell remained dedicated to those separate futures. I was frightened to death to ever ask her for a date, but I finally worked up enough courage to ask her to go at Christmas time to, to the Messiah that they were going to have in the chapel. And so I took her to the Messiah, and uh, she was everything that I had heard about her. Very beautiful and, and very warm and very friendly, and so our romance began at that time. I remember coming back from the date and that praying that night. I said, Lord, if you'll let me marry that man, I'll consider it the greatest privilege imaginable. Graham proposed to Ruth before she left Wheaton to care for her sister Rosa, who'd been diagnosed with tuberculosis. Ruth wasn't able to say yes at that moment, but Billy was sure that she would seriously ponder the question during their long separation. Finally, she wrote Graham a lengthy letter informing him that God had been working on her heart and that she would marry him. Graham was so ecstatic, he took off running, and then when he preached that night, he had no idea what he said and wasn't sure the people did either. After they graduated from Wheaton, they were married August the 13th, 1943, in Montreat, North Carolina, where Ruth's parents had settled after leaving China before the communists took over. 
Graham took his first and only pastorate at Village Baptist Church in Western Springs, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, shortly after he and Ruth were married. The church had 35 members and was only just able to afford construction of the basement of what they hoped someday would be a completed church building. It was while Graham was the pastor in Western Springs that Torrey Johnson, a preacher of a large church in Chicago and main speaker on two radio programs, offered Graham the opportunity to take over Songs in the Night. This would be a major turning point in his life and the beginning of his appeal to a mass audience. I said, yeah, we've got to get uh, George Beverly Shea. And they said, oh, you couldn't get an appointment with him. Said he's wanted by everybody. He's the best singer probably in the country. I went into Chicago and the secretary there said I couldn't see him. I couldn't get an appointment. But I saw him through a glass door. And I just went over there and opened the door and walked in. And one morning, a knock on my door. And there was a tall young fellow, blonde hair. He was 21 and I was 31. And that was Billy Graham. So he had a program he was taking over called Songs in the Night. It was on a 50,000 watt station. It was really something, you know. And uh, he was on that for the year and a half. He was pastor there. Shea accepted Graham's offer to be part of Songs in the Night. And the first programs were broadcast from the aforementioned Western Springs Church basement. Speaking invitations poured in from several surrounding states requesting Graham to hold meetings. His frequent absence from the church in Western Springs began to cause discontent among some of the deacons who felt that Graham was ignoring his responsibilities, even though they had in fact agreed to his travels when he'd accepted the position of pastor. It was during this time that fellow evangelist Torrey Johnson put into place the Youth for Christ program designed to provide alternative activities for servicemen and young people in the Chicago area. When Youth for Christ began to expand to other cities in the US and Canada, Johnson asked Graham to take on some of the preaching responsibilities. These factors, coupled with Graham's own restlessness to preach the gospel anywhere and everywhere, soon led to his resignation at Western Springs. In December of 1947, Graham agreed to become the president of Northwestern Schools in Minneapolis a liberal arts college and theological seminary. Throughout his four-year tenure at Northwestern, he continued to preach at Youth for Christ rallies all over the country, and he was on the road more than half the time. I was a traveling salesman again, he said, not displaying a case of brushes this time, just brandishing my Bible. Torrey Johnson's vision for Youth for Christ would not be exclusive to the United States and Canada. He had a vision to make Youth for Christ an international evangelistic movement among young people, and for Graham to spearhead the organization by becoming its first full-time evangelist. Less than a year after World War II, the team went to Europe. It was a perfect time to go. People were reeling from the war. There were shortages, hardships, and rationing. Food was scarce and so many people were hungry, not just for something to satisfy their empty stomachs, but for something to satisfy their empty souls. The need was so great, they split up in teams, traveling throughout the British Isles and Europe, holding three or four meetings a day in churches, movie houses, and public halls, anywhere a crowd could gather. There was another more personal kind of suffering that Graham was experiencing at this time, which was the separations from Ruth. Even though they both knew this was part of their life that they'd chosen and agreed to it, the pain of extended separation still took its toll. Ruth wrote in Footprints of a Pilgrim, to keep me company, I used to sleep with Bill's tweed jacket when he was away. Graham traveled 200,000 miles in that first year with Youth for Christ, beginning a lifetime of frequent trips that would keep him away from home. 
Since he would be gone most of the time, Billy and Ruth decided it would be best if she moved near her parents in Montreat, North Carolina, where they had settled after leaving China. This would provide comfort and stability for Ruth during Graham's long absences, crisscrossing the country and holding rally after rally. In fact, Graham finally held one in Asheville, North Carolina, just a short drive from Montreat. The song leader originally scheduled was absent. It just so happened that a young man from California traveling through North Carolina on his honeymoon was in the audience. And when Graham found out he could lead congregational singing, he asked to meet him. That chance introduction started a lifelong ministry together. We were staying in the home of some friends and he asked us if uh, we'd like to go hear a young man speak at a youth rally. When we pulled up to the conference grounds, the director of the conference met my friend whose home we were staying and said, uh, We've got a little problem tonight. We're ready to begin the service, but we don't have anybody to lead the singing. And my friend turned and he looked at me and he said, you'll be happy to help, won't you? And Billy standing there with a big smile said, come on, Cliff, we won't be choosy. Let's go. It was shortly after that, we went to Winona Lake, Indiana, and the Youth for Christ International was formed. And they asked us if we would join with them a short time afterwards, and we've been together ever since. After his first brief trip to England, Graham had felt such empathy for her people that he'd prayed about returning to help lead a revival there. Youth for Christ could not sponsor a return trip so quickly, so Graham had to raise the support himself at home. He asked Cliff Barrows and his wife, Billy, to join he and Ruth on the trip. In November of 1948, Billy, Cliff, Grady and Bev Shea were holding a revival in Modesto, California, which was Cliff's hometown. Bill mentioned to us, you know, we know that evangelists in the past have run into difficulties and have stumbled along the way and have, have uh, gotten involved in things that have brought disrepute to the cause of Christ. And he said, let's go to our rooms and let's think about experiences we've heard about and things that we know have, have taken place. And let's write these down and come back and we'll share them and ask God to guard us from making those mistakes. The list they compiled contained just four items. The first dealt with money. Too many evangelists had an Elmer Gantry approach for giving an emotional appeal, trying to wring as much money out of a crowd as possible, giving all traveling evangelists a bad name. They decided that there needed to be accountability for all finances, and they formed an independent committee to handle all financial matters. Secondly, they would never allow themselves to be alone with another woman other than their wives. That would protect them both from temptation and from the media. The third issue was to never be critical of the local pastors and churches, and finally, they would not falsify their publicity or exaggerate their success. They would let the local authorities decide how many people had attended the meetings and they wouldn't make extravagant claims in their publicity. And in that way, they have protected themselves against the kind of scandals that have destroyed or weakened other ministries. And so many times, I mean, it's, it's become such a famous uh, incident that it's, I think Cliff named it the Modesto Manifesto. Graham's wish was to remain pure in all these issues. Because of the humility of these men and their desire to serve God, the experience in Modesto planted the seed for what was to become the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association.
We've been to Charlotte in the first organized meeting, and then we've been to Modesto, his hometown, to a place in Pennsylvania, and uh, then we went to um, Augusta, Georgia. Augusta, Georgia. And along about that time, we, we heard we were going to go to Los Angeles, and it was going to be a big tent. After limited successes in several mid-sized cities, Graham was ready to try a longer stay in a larger city. The opportunity came when a committee of preachers from churches in the Los Angeles area invited Graham to lead a citywide, old-fashioned tent revival. Several weeks before the campaign began, Graham was invited to attend a conference at Forest Home Retreat Center in California with other leading theologians of the day, including his friend from Youth for Christ, Charles Templeton. Templeton had been examining at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary historical and literary criticism of the Bible that undercut the view of Scripture as inspired. A blow to any individual's faith. He talked with Billy about this. Billy was troubled. Graham knew that brilliant minds throughout the ages had worked on these issues without getting any definitive conclusions. Billy struggled deeply with the issues of biblical inspiration and accuracy that Templeton had raised. He was even accused by Templeton of having a faith that was too simple. One night, Graham took a walk in the San Bernardino Mountains that surround the conference center. So I went out one night. There was a stump where a tree had been cut down or had fallen, and I laid the Bible on it, and I said, Lord, I, I don't understand this book. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand, but I accept this as your word by faith. I can't prove it intellectual. And so I went back with a great sense of peace in my heart, and from then on I could discuss with them on the basis of the fact of faith. Of course, they laughed at that. That night, Graham made the conscious decision to go beyond his doubts and his fears and accept by faith the Bible as the inspired Word of God. After the soul-searching experience at Forest Home, Graham was now ready for his most ambitious effort to date, the L.A. Crusade. The crowds were relatively small for the first two weeks, and the committee sponsoring the campaign debated whether or not to continue. Everyone knew the fate of this campaign would be a defining moment for his ministry. The first indication the campaign should carry on was the conversion of popular radio personality Stuart Hambran at the end of the third week. When Hambran gave his testimony on his radio program, the crowds began to increase, justifying the decision to extend the campaign. But the question still remained, for how long? One night in what is one of the pivotal events in Billy Graham's career, he showed up at the tent at Washington and Hill Streets, and the place was overflowing with uh, newspaper reporters. Before this, there'd be a few religion reporters, a story or two in the, uh, the Los Angeles Examiner, but nothing like this. It was just overflowing with reporters, and Billy said, what's going on here? And a reporter came to him and said, you've just been kissed by William Randolph Hearst and he showed him a piece of paper that looked like something had been torn off of a wire service machine, and it just had two famous words on it, Puff Graham. William Randolph Hearst had given orders to his newspapers to give Billy Graham publicity. Soon afterwards, stories in Time, Life, Newsweek, and Billy Graham became nationally known, and the, the, after that, the tent was filled, people standing outside, and the revival went on another four weeks. And today, we're in desperate need of the voice of the prophets of Amos and Isaiah to rise once again and warn the people of America to prepare to meet Almighty God. And we're praying... At the close of the eighth week, the crusade finally came to an end. Graham had preached 65 sermons, had spoken at three or four special appearances during the day throughout the crusade and given dozens of interviews. He and other team members were exhausted but the overall feeling was one of exhilaration and awe at what they had experienced. 
with the LA Crusade, Graham and his team were to be thrust into the national scene like no other evangelist before him. As he and Ruth returned to Minneapolis by train, neither of them was sure if this phenomenon was a climax or a beginning, but they were sure they had seen God at work. The Graham received from the press in Los Angeles was only the beginning. He drew even more attention back east as he held crusades from Georgia to New England. On the last day of the South Carolina crusade, Life magazine wrote, quote, not since the great days of Billy Sunday had South Carolina seen anything like it. On March the 12th, more than 40,000 spectators overflowed the stadium. It was the biggest crowd Graham had ever drawn. And then by 1950, radio would offer something Graham could never imagine. Although Graham had already seen the power of local radio with his program in Chicago, Songs in the Night, he had to be talked into going beyond that small area. Two public relations specialists, Walter Bennett and Fred Dinert, were persistent in their encouragement to get Graham to sign a contract with ABC to go on their national radio network. Remember where our first broadcast was? Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia, yes. At exactly 2 p.m. on Sunday, November the 5th, 1950, Cliff Barrow stepped up to a microphone in crowded Ponce de Leon Baseball Park and said... This is the hour of decision. And this is Cliff Barrow, welcoming you to the first of a series of broadcasts to be presented each week at this time under the auspices of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. It was Ruth who suggested the program be named The Hour of Decision because Graham's emphasis was on people making a decision for Christ. For the next 30 minutes, the program was on the air live over the ABC network, broadcasting coast to coast on over 150 stations to a potential audience of 9 million. The response to those first broadcasts was just astonishing. Within a few weeks, letters started pouring into the organization, with many of those letters containing financial donations. Within five weeks, the Arab decision had the highest audience rating in the history of religious broadcasting. And within five years, NBC as well carried the program, making the number of radio stations broadcasting the program a total of well over 800. This was such a help because every crusade city became a studio. In spite of the success of the first broadcast of the Hour of Decision from Atlanta, there were some embarrassing consequences of holding the campaign in that city. With the Atlanta Constitution showed at, toward the end of the, at the end of the crusade, showed two pictures side by side. One was of some happy ushers holding up sacks of money that they had collected, and the other was of Billy Graham waving as he got into a car leaving the hotel at the, at the end as he was about to leave town. Well, the implication there was um, Billy Graham, certainly he's happy and smiling because he's got bags of money that he's collected in this, uh, in this uh, event. Even though the local committee was taking care of this, it certainly left the kind of impression in the average reader's uh, mind that here we've got another money huckstering um, evangelist. Graham never wanted this type of misunderstanding to be repeated. After receiving advice and counsel from older ministers, it was decided that Graham would go on staff at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and be paid a salary comparable to the amount received by a church pastor. That decision, along with other fiscal policy safeguards put in place by the association, removed any potential taint of charlatanism from the organization.
Graham put down roots in Montreat, North Carolina, overlooking the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Because of his meteoric rise to prominence, the curiosity seekers would descend into Montreat, hoping for a look at the popular evangelist's home and perhaps to catch a glimpse of him and his family. Ruth said, enough of this notion that the Grahams are public property. She and Billy found 200 acres a mile up the mountain as the crow flies, bought it, and shortly after the purchase began to build their home away from the public eye. Graham often said that he and Ruth were called as a team. God had called him to travel and preach, and Ruth was called to manage the household and rear the children. But before her family duties became too demanding, Ruth did go with Graham to England for an extended campaign. Just two days before he and Ruth were to dock in England to begin the Greater London Crusade in 1954, they received word that a member of parliament would challenge the admission of Billy Graham to England on the grounds that the American evangelist was interfering in British politics under the guise of religion. This three-month campaign would clearly be the greatest test the young minister and his crusade team had had to date. The English press filled its pages upon his arrival with antagonistic and hostile headlines and stories. There was controversy as the edition was about to begin, uh, and really it was very beneficial that that was so because it gave Mr. Graham prominence immediately. He was front page headlines at some points. Who was this man who could preach like this, looking like a film star? Many of the press and much of the London clergy were very skeptical, and there were dire predictions that the crusade would be a failure. I distrust the use of crowd techniques to influence individual decisions. My difficulty is the type of member they are, are producing, which is not, in my view, the best. I'm not convinced that Billy Graham is the answer to England's problem. The pressure was relentless, and even though the press was not kind, it had at least put the crusade front and centre in the public's eye. But on the opening evening, it seemed not only negative press, but also the weather was conspiring against them. Outside, there was sleet and freezing rain. And Graham got a call from one of his associates who was at Harringay, who told him that there were hundreds of photographers photographing empty seats. When Billy and Ruth arrived at the back of the arena, they saw no one. Then a member of their team told them that out front, there were thousands trying to get in. It poured with rain, but thousands came. People would come forward, sometimes holding their shoes in their hands as they paddled across the turf in their feet and socks and shoes, without just in their socks, and uh, to make their commitment to our Lord. That was the turning point. The harping began to gradually die out as the numbers of people who came night after night began to break records. The Crusade team now had a different problem, how to accommodate the swelling numbers. They didn't want to keep turning people away, and British radio were not carrying the meetings. But then, to solve the problem, an ABC network radio engineer, Bob Benninghoff, devised a unique idea. Bob got his pencil and a piece of paper out, and he began to draw some technical figures, and and he outlined the schematic for a landline hookup yeah. to auditoriums, if we could get permission from the post office department to use those lines. They hadn't been used for anything like that since the war. And eventually the demand became so great that they, they started something that, they, that now sees itself in satellite television, but they ran landline relays broadcasting over the telephone lines to uh, rented halls, to churches and other areas. By the time the crusade was over, there were 430 sites where the Billy Graham crusade could be listened to. It turned out to be one of the great events of Billy Graham's career. And indeed, many young men were converted at that time who later filled evangelical seminaries and played a real role in an evangelical renaissance in, uh, in Great Britain. 
For the 88 nights of the Greater London Crusade, every seat was taken at Haringey Arena. Some evenings there were so many people waiting outside, when the doors closed, a second service was added. The three months of meetings set new attendance records of over two million, with nearly 40,000 decisions for Christ. You come, we're going to wait on you. Every head bow while we wait. Just get up right now, quickly. Hundreds of you, all over the place, come. You remember in England when we went back to Earl's Court uh, after the Herringay meetings, it was about 10 years later, and some of the younger reporters we're trying to review the press releases from the Herringay meetings to try to decide why so many people responded. And they said, well, it was the emotional appeal of Just As I Am mm -hmm. that that got people worked up. And, mm -hmm. of course, Billy knew that that wasn't true. He said, Cliff, maybe we won't sing Just As I Am for the invitation. Maybe we'll not have any song. Just let's be sensitive to what the Spirit of God says to us and if I call for it, sing it. But if I don't, don't have the organ play, don't have any music. I said, okay. Well, that first night at Earl's Court, he preached, and then he said, we're not going to have any music tonight. If you want to give your heart to Christ, you stand up and come forward. You come now. We're going to wait right now. Just get up quickly from everywhere. Up in the balcony. You may be a choir member, you might even be a steward here, but God has spoken to you tonight, you come. He said, we're just going to wait and we're going to pray. He stepped back a little bit from the pulpit as he always does. And we, all you could hear was the shuffle on the floor of people coming forward. We went for 30 days yeah. without singing just as I am. That, that was a historical time. It was indeed. And uh, the same reporters that had said just as I am was too emotional. At the end of the meeting, they were writing, give us back just as I am. The <laughs> silence is killing us. Yeah. While Graham was in England, he'd wanted very much to meet Winston Churchill, but Churchill had turned down his requests. But by the end of the crusade, which finished with a gigantic meeting in Wembley Stadium, Churchill had changed his mind. So as Prime Minister, he invited Graham to come to meet him at 10 Downing Street for what was supposed to be five... <laughs> minutes. So I went over, I walked in, and uh, he shook hands with me. He was a shorter man than I had thought. He said, young man, he said, I want to ask you a question. He said, what do you say that fills all these big stadiums? And I told him, I said, it's the gospel of Christ. I said, sir, people are hungry to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, that must be it. He said, uh, you know, I'm an old man. I don't have any hope for the world. And he said, do you have hope? I said, yes, sir. And I took my New Testament out and I turned from scripture to scripture and read to him. As we were going out the door, 
He shook hands with me and he said, this conversation, as long as I live, will be between us. Is that agreed? I said, yes. So I never told it as long as he was alive. With the press now praising him for his integrity and the overwhelming gratitude from the public, Graham's rise as an international evangelist seems secure. I've been asked in the last few minutes by a number of newspaper reporters of Great Britain what our last message is. Our last message to all the people is to carry on that which we believe God has begun. Goodbye and God bless you. In 1957, New York presented as great a challenge to Graham as London had. Many in the press were equally as skeptical, condescendingly reporting that Graham was coming to save New York. Before leaving Montreat, Graham wrote in his diary, there are many of my friends who have predicted that the New York crusade could end in failure. I have prayed more over this assignment and wept more over the city of New York than any other city we've ever been to. Now it is in God's hands. The general popular press was much more positive toward, uh, toward the crusade, and the New York Times covered the opening service, gave it two full pages, even printed verbatim this sermon, and a number of the papers there gave extensive credit throughout that long summer, which was very tough on him just to preach every night. Again, he had the problem of, uh, as he'd had in, in Los Angeles years earlier, had the problem of how do I come up with more sermons? Uh, it was quite an effort, but uh, it was an enormous, um, enormous success. He preached to 100,000 in Yankee Stadium, preached to tens of thousands down at an open air meeting in Wall Street, and wound up the meeting with well more than 100,000 in Times Square just preaching through the urban canyons. It's a marvelous picture to, to see him standing there as if he had really triumphed. You know, the, the gospel in Gotham had been, had been a success. I'm going to ask you to give your life to him now. As in London, attendance records were broken at the garden. As in London, the crusade had to extend its stay because of the demand. And also, as in London, almost nightly Graham was called from the podium to address the overflow crowd standing outside, unable to get in. But unlike London, the crusade had the opportunity to take the services beyond the Big Apple. During the 1957 New York Crusade, ABC offered Graham the time to go on live television on Saturday night. The press was skeptical. On a night when everyone sat at home watching television for entertainment, the expectation of attracting an audience for religion was very low. Graham said, I'll be happy to get the leftovers that aren't watching the other programs. Those broadcasts were the beginning of television for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Madison Square Garden and the Billy Graham New York Crusade. Tonight's service marks the end, at least the closing with tomorrow night's service as well of the 12th week of this crusade and again it's our privilege to present to you the 1500 voice crusade choir with Ted Smith at the piano, Paul Mickelson at the organ. This great congregation here at Madison Square Garden will be singing for you. We have a very special guest too you won't want to miss. So why not call a friend now and ask them to share the next 59 minutes with us. We'd sure appreciate it if you would. And to begin our program, we're going to ask America's beloved gospel singer, George Beverly Shea, to come and sing for us right now. All right, Beth. For the first time, Graham was preaching live to the nation's living rooms through the television screen, and the impact was tremendous. ABC estimated that 7 million viewers watched each telecast. America was being given front row seats in the most famous arena in the country. The ice show comes in here. I think that's the next event in the garden. We may have to have meetings all night. 
That's all you need. It was the first nationally televised religious broadcast. And if somebody calls on Graham said, we're reaching more through these telecasts than we could reach in a lifetime at Madison Square Garden. While these many people are coming here, bow your head. Say yes to Christ. Let him come into your life and make you a new person. Change the whole direction of your life. You can do it right now. God bless you. The hottest day of the year was June the 20th, 1957, the day the New York Crusade was scheduled to end. 100,000 people jammed Yankee Stadium with another 20,000 outside. After an introduction by Vice President Richard Nixon, Graham preached to the largest crowd ever assembled to hear him or any other evangelist in this country. On October 23rd, 4th and 5th, the Yankees will play the White Sox. Stadium, 18 of the best ball players in the world, and they will have a hard time getting this stadium filled. And so Billy Graham, one man filling it, should feel pretty proud of himself. But you know what he said? You know what he said? His reaction was, I didn't fill this stadium, God filled it. You say, well, Billy, what is repentance? Repentance means that you acknowledge that you failed God, that you've sinned against God, and you're willing to renounce your sins. You're willing to give up your sins. And it means something else. It means that by faith you must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must come to the foot of the cross and by an act of your will choose Christ. Say, I will receive him. I will give my life to him. I will surrender to him. I will receive him as my Lord and Savior and Master. And some of you may wait beyond the time when the Spirit of God speaks to you because you see, you cannot come to Christ any time you want to. You can only come when the Spirit of God is drawing you and pulling you and speaking to you. And the Spirit of God is speaking to you tonight. The Spirit of God is speaking to thousands of you. And that's the only time you can come to Christ when the Spirit of God draws you to the cross. Don't you hesitate. Don't you wait. You may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. We've had a wonderful and thrilling week here at the Cow Palace. People have come to visit us from all over America and for that part all over the world. And one of those that flew out all the way from Louisville, Kentucky to be with us this week is a man that takes my mind back 24 years. Because the night that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, he was the evangelist. And of course, Grady Wilson and I and those of us that received Christ under his ministry have been moved this week as we have fellowship with him. He's 81 years of age one of the great evangelists of our time. I want Dr. Mordecai Ham to come and bring us a word of greeting. Let's give him a welcome to the cow pass. This is the happiest moment of my life when I see this young boy now being used of God 
to speak practically to the nations of the world. And as I've listened to these representatives, this is nation and worldwide. There is a long line of great evangelists recorded in church history. The very first one to travel the world preaching the gospel was the Apostle Paul. Almost 2,000 years before Graham, the Apostle Paul... traveling to cities all over the Roman Empire. This passion for taking the gospel to the world was shared by Graham. But it was an impossible task for one man. It would require organization and a team effort. During a crusade in Portland, Oregon in 1950, money was donated apart from the regular offering for future radio broadcasts. It was clear to Graham and to Grady that they needed to create a formal organization to handle these financial matters. Graham called on George Wilson, the business manager of Northwestern School, and he drew up articles of incorporation. Office space for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association was rented directly across the street from the school in Minneapolis. The organizational lessons learned from the large crusades in Los Angeles, London and New York and smaller ones in other parts of the United States helped the team prepare for the cascade of invitations to hold crusades that poured in from every continent. Before the New York crusade had even ended, over a hundred invitations had been received. As the number of crusades increased each year and Graham's popularity grew, it meant that for him, the time spent at home became less and less. Graham was concerned about striking a balance between his work and home so that his children didn't grow up resenting him or his ministry. In spite of the understanding and acceptance the family had of why Graham had to be gone so much of the time, they could never escape from the pain of lengthy separations. Graham made an entry in his personal diary right before leaving for the next crusade. This is the first spring that I've ever spent at home. What a wonderful and thrilling few weeks this has been. To run and play with my children every day, to listen to their problems. Today, Ruth and I took our last stroll. Little Franklin keeps pleading, Daddy, don't go. I've come to love this mountain top and would like nothing better than for the Lord to say I should stay here for the rest of my life. The 1960s were a crucial time in America of unsettling turmoil. The country seemed to be a cordon of protests, riots and marches, and Graham knew he must not isolate himself from these problems. Instead, face them head on. He believed the great commandment that Christ gave to love our neighbor as ourselves 
was not selective, but applied to all, regardless of circumstance, depth of need, and above all, color of skin. The more Graham reflected on the messages he had preached over the years, he knew in his heart that there was no place for segregation within the Christian faith. Two years before the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, desegregating public schools, Graham was fighting his own battle against segregation at the crusade in Jackson, Mississippi. It was a common practice at public meetings at that time in the South for ropes to be put up designating white and black seating areas. But Graham said they were not to have segregated seating, even though the local committee balked at that demand. So he physically removed the ropes that demarcated the area where blacks were to sit, which was a significant gesture since he didn't know what the impact might be. A similar incident happened a year later in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He immediately tore the ropes down. The head usher was so incensed by Graham's action that he resigned in anger, right on the spot. However, Graham refused to back down. But when God looks at you, he doesn't look on the outward appearance. The Bible says he looks upon the heart. Perhaps the greatest stand that Billy Graham ever took on behalf of the civil rights movement came a few years later in 1957 at the New York Crusade. He invited a young black minister, Howard Jones from Cleveland, to join his staff and be an associate evangelist. He said to me one day, what can I do to reach blacks in Harlem and in New York City if they're not coming? I said, there's one thing you could do. He said, what? I said, go where they are. Howard Jones went into Harlem, organized black churches, and had Billy Graham speak to packed houses there. Still, the crowds at Madison Square Garden during the early weeks were mostly white, and that distressed Graham. I saw the articles uh, that were written coming from pastors, white pastors, in New York and greater vicinity. And these pastors said, you don't need that in preacher on your team. You're going to ruin your team.
It was a common practice at public meetings at that time in the South for ropes to be put up designating white and black seating areas. But Graham said they were not to have segregated seating, even though the local committee balked at that demand. So he physically removed the ropes that demarcated the area where blacks were to sit, which was a significant gesture since he didn't know what the impact might be. A similar incident happened a year later in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He immediately tore the ropes down. The head usher was so incensed by Graham's action that he resigned in anger, right on the spot. However, Graham refused to back down. But when God looks at you, he doesn't look on the outward appearance. The Bible says he looks upon the heart. Perhaps the greatest stand that Billy Graham ever took on behalf of the civil rights movement came a few years later in 1957 at the New York Crusade. He invited a young black minister, Howard Jones from Cleveland, to join his staff and be an associate evangelist. He said to me one day, what can I do to reach blacks in Harlem and in New York City if they're not coming? I said, there's one thing you could do. He said, what? I said, go where they are. Howard Jones went into Harlem, organized black churches, and had Billy Graham speak to packed houses there. Still, the crowds at Madison Square Garden during the early weeks were mostly white, and that distressed Graham. I saw the articles uh, that were written, coming from pastors, white pastors, in New York and greater vicinity. And these pastors said, you don't need that in preacher on your team. You're going to ruin your team. 